You're listening to Season 6 of Mobile Suit Breakdown, a weekly podcast covering the entirety of sci-fi mega-franchise Mobile Suit Gundam. For new fans, old fans, and not yet fans, we analyze all 42 years of Gundam, episode by episode and movie by movie, researching its influences, examining its themes, and discussing how each piece of the Gundam canon fits within the changing context in Japan and the world, from 1979 to today. This is episode 6.3, Rock and Roll High School, and we are your hosts. I'm Tom, a lifelong Gundam fan, and it's probably just Stockholm Syndrome, but I rather enjoyed this one. And I'm Nina, new to this run of SD Gundam and wondering, have I lost all perspective? Or was this one okay? <laughs> Let's be very cautious in our compliments. Mobile Suit Breakdown is made possible by the support of 612 patrons and subscribers. Thank you all, and special thanks go out to our newest supporters, Ryan S. and Cha-Cha. If you enjoy MSB, help keep us independent and ad-free by subscribing on Patreon, making a one-time payment on Ko-fi, buying us research materials from our wishlist, or writing us a review wherever you listen to podcasts. Links to all of the different ways to support us are on our website, gundampodcast.com slash support. This week we are covering Arashi Oyobu Gakuensai, or the Storm Summoning School Festival, the first of two SD shorts which together form Kido Senshi SD Gantamu no Gyakushu, or Mobile Suit SD Gundam's Counterattack. The word used for counterattack, Gyakushu, is the same one used in the title of Shar's Counterattack, and incidentally in the Japanese title of The Empire Strikes Back as well. However, the word order is different. Gandamu no Gyakushu versus Gyakushu no Sha. As a rule, when using the particle no to indicate that one thing belongs to another, the possessor is listed first, and the possession is listed second. Thus, Gyakushu no Sha might alternately be read as Shar of the counterattack, which suggests both that Shar's personhood has been swallowed up in his counterattack, and that the movie is more about him than about the counterattack. That's not the case for the shorts in front of us, but it is interesting to me that despite the identical word choice, the shorts creators decided not to copy the syntax. SD Gundam's Counterattack was first released on July 15, 1989, between episodes 4 and 5 of War in the Pocket. Thus, at this point, the Kempfer and Alex mobile suits had both made their proper debuts. Like the original three SD shorts, Counterattack was made as a theatrical short, and it played before Oshi Mamoru's Kido Keisatsu Patoreba Geki Joban, or Mobile Police Pat Labor, the movie. Although not a Sunrise production, Pat Labor was also sponsored by Bandai, and, in a fun coincidence, the voice actors for Haman, Sela, Chris, and Bernie all appeared in the movie as well. Amino Tetsuro returns as the head director and writer for the Storm Summoning School Festival, and Sato Gen returns as animation director. Working under Amino as episode director is a new addition to the SD team, Tanazawa Takashi. He is a mecha animator, perhaps best known as one of the mechanical designers for World War II revisionist OVA series Konpeki no Kantai. This will be his one and only stint on Gundam, so you don't need to remember his name. The music was done by Totsuka Osamu, who had also arranged the opening and ending theme songs for 0080, among others. Unlike Tanazawa, Totsuka will be returning for more SD in the future. And now, the recap. The Zeta Academy for Girls and the new School for Boys, two private schools on top of the hill, are planning a shared school festival, the event crowned by the opening of a bridge between the two school buildings. 
As student council presidents, Shar and Haman have a video call to discuss their plans. Shar on a throne surrounded by roses, Haman fetching him drinks and Rambaral polishing his shoes, and Haman in a bathhouse being scrubbed and rinsed by Ellen Rue, and mobile suits carefully shielding parts of her from view. At the other end of town, lush greenery turns to flat, brown dust. The students of the counterattack school, envious of the elites up on the hill, prepare to crash the party. Mohawk Haro scouts ahead, while the private school students decorate and build a stage for the Alex Band. Sirocco and Jared enjoy the indoor driving range, while Sarah and Moar bring them refreshments, and Principal Degwin uses binoculars to ogle girls all over campus. A select group of students participate in a dating club, the boys urged by a rollerblading, baseball bat-wielding Chris to get over their shyness and make a move. In their wild clothes and souped-up vehicles, the counterattack school rides out. They fire paintballs at the schools, rush the stage so their own band can perform, and crash the dating club meeting, where Camille proceeds to interrupt every introduction. Characters in mobile suits spray graffiti on every surface, faster than Shar and his cohort can scrub it off. Lala's jealous ghost keeps appearing to Shar and Haman, and she helps Amuro reveal Shar's delinquent past. The private schools and their bridge are destroyed in the commotion. Lala reveals that Haman also had a delinquent past, and the two student council presidents join the students from the counterattack school and ride off into the sunset. The most useful thing I've learned so far in our own coverage of these SD shorts is that a lot of the people writing them are not necessarily familiar with the source material, which is helpful because otherwise there are certain scenes that are just too distracting in how weird or uncomfortable they are or how confusing. But I'm thinking specifically of Degwin flirting with Minerva, his granddaughter. <laughs> Both of them were in First Gundam though. Like, I'm sorry, but they had to know about that. That's just exactly as weird and confusing as it is. Oh, don't say that. I'm sorry. It is. It's the worst. It's the low point of what is otherwise a pretty good episode. There are plenty of other bits that are, I think, <laughs> pretty confusing and weird. Uh, but you brought up the first Gundam thing. That also means that the writers should have theoretically known who Rambaral and Haman were mm -hmm. and their roles are kind of weird although i love 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 that in the scene where haman is being rinsed off and is about to be totally exposed and then the stage hand mobile suits come in to cover up uh certain certain portions haman seems just as disappointed by this <laughs> as ramba yes, and yes. char are there's a um there's a surprising amount of bisexual representation in this episode. It's true. After Degwin strikes out with all those girls, he presents the flowers to a guy. Yeah. Gaia, in fact. Gaia the guy. <laughs> and, like, it's a joke because everything in this is a joke, but it's not presented as, like, haha, guys being interested in guys. That's so weird. Haha. <laughs> it's just, like, it's funny because Degwin is leching on everybody. Right. There's also an implied gay romance between two mobile suits. When they're showing us the boys and girls social club um, and they do like pans across the girls side and the guys side and everybody's kind of like blushing and nervous and sweating. Um, on the guys side, there's a Rigazi um, blushing and sticking his finger directly into the chest of a Jagan who is also blushing and holding up a hand like, I'm not really into that. <laughs> but that Rigazi is Definitely attracted to that Jagan. <laughs> the mobile suits are gay. The, the, the most ridiculous statement. <laughs> uh, yeah. I love it. Not ridiculous in that they couldn't be gay. I mean, sentient mobile suits running around in school uniforms. The whole thing is pretty out there, right? Yeah. There's been a, a sort of recurring discussion in our chat room among the patrons about which mobile suits are like 
coded with feminine attributes, which ones are girl bots, for instance. And it's a fun debate that comes up every once in a while because you can argue a lot of things one way or the other, like the Zeta's high heels. Um, but this short just assigns a bunch of the mobile suits to be girls and a bunch of them to be boys. So here's a definitive list for you, I guess, about which ones are which. Unless they contradict themselves later, which they may well do. Yeah, who knows? <laughs> The other big thing for me in this short in particular, though I'm sure it's true across all of the SDs, this is just where I noticed it the most. For a piece of animation that's so, I mean, I hate to say this, but poor quality. <laughs> uh huh. There are so many great jokes in the backgrounds and so many neat little details in the background and in the character design. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. So many moments that pass very quickly and that I might not even have noticed if I wasn't going through certain sections of it at a slower frame rate. Mm -hmm. And there are some deep cut references just snuck in in the background. There's a gym trainer at one point in this. Garma is driving around on a Dodai YS that's been turned into a car. Like these are obscure things. Garma is driving four around while she beats up Bright <laughs> for some reason. There are a lot of scenes of four beating up Bright, at Be least two. <laughs> beats up is... Um, okay, kicking him in the groin she's repeatedly. Got, she's got his ankles in each hand and she's just stomping. <laughs> oh, poor Bright. Poor history teacher Bright. At least he's already got kids. Uh, speaking of history teacher Bright, Bright in those glasses... Oh, oh, are you fanning yourself? Nina's fanning herself over Bright in the glasses. It's going to give me the vapors. <laughs> Where are my glasses? I did translate what is on the board in those shots. I'm fairly certain that the book he's holding says history. This is one of those things where because of the poor image quality, a lot of the kanji are hard to read, but it's the vague shape and it fits with what's on the board. And then his first bullet point is... Taika no Kaishin, or the Taika Reforms, which was a big, important political and historical event from like the 500s. I think they came up a little bit in my research pieces about the tale of the Heike. So if you're really curious about what we have to say about the Taika Reforms, you can go back and listen to those again. And then his second bullet point is, I'm fairly positive, Bukyo Dendai, which is probably talking about the importation of Buddhism. And then the final bullet point is Titansu. <laughs> <laughs> so big historical events in the history of Japan and then the Titans. Right. I guess an equivalent for us Americans would be like the Revolutionary War, the Louisiana Purchase, and then <laughs> sea beams glittering in the night off the Tannhauser Gate. There was one other, uh, I think, very important thing that I noticed about kanji in this episode, in particular in the graffiti. Sometimes it's actual words. And there was a, a kanji for congratulations in there. At one point, it looks like Amuro is painting baka on the wall. However, I ran into a sequence of characters that were nonsense. They didn't mean anything. And then... There was a point that looked like a name. I was looking up some of these kanji, and there was the first name, Seita, and then there was the last name, Ryu, or Tokuru, or Tome, or Tomeru. And so I thought, well, maybe that's a person, and they snuck their name into this, and I kept looking, and I plugged these characters into Japanese Wikipedia. And what I found was... <laughs> That sequence of characters I found that I couldn't find a meaning for can be pronounced Daburu Zeta. Mm. So if, like me, every time you see kanji on the screen, you're trying to figure out what kanji it is and what they're writing, and you get stuck because it doesn't appear to mean anything, check the readings and see if it's a reference to the name of a Gundam show or the name of a Gundam character. As we saw in Gundam Densetsu, Gundam Legend, they occasionally just like pick some characters for Gundamu and throw them in there. Uh, and similarly, they can and do pick characters for the names of other series and just use them. They're not canonical or anything, which makes it harder to follow. 
I fully expect that they will change some of the characters they use for Gandamu, for other names. Uh, so it's going to be tricky. But if you get stuck and you're wondering, why can't I find this word? It might not be a word. They might just be using them for their readings. Speaking of characters, but a different kind of characters, I thought the characterizations in this episode really worked and were really funny in a way that um, prior iterations of SD Gundam haven't been able to pull off. Um, funny and memorable. I thought so too. I just didn't necessarily think they were consistent with who the characters are in their original series. True. But it was very fun. As SDs go, this one was pretty good. Yeah, in my mind, between all of the like blink and you miss it references, the constant parade of jokes, many of which are actually funny, these very memorable new takes on established characters, sort of inverting a lot of the assumptions of the series thus far, I feel like this is the first SD short that has really kind of realized the potential of SD Gundam. And it's not as if it doesn't have problems. We talked about Daegwin already, and we'll talk about some of the other stuff, I'm sure. But it's living up to its potential, I think. And pervy old man is such a trope. Even in Ranma half, mm -hmm. there is, a, I think Ranma's grandfather is constantly stealing panties from girls at the local high school. Yeah. Among other things. Yeah. I mean, it is absolutely a stock trope. And what bugs me about it is not the inclusion of a character like that, but that when a show includes a character like that, it's usually because it creates an excuse for the show to be pervy rather than just making fun of this old lecher. Like here, Degwin is a vector to give us those like leering binocular shots of the cute girls with, you know, upskirt moments and, uh, displaying their three measurements on screen with a rating from the binoculars. Like for um, Veltorchka and Sela and Emma, we, you know, get the the bust, waist and hip ratios. And then the binoculars tell us whether they're, hang on, I wrote this down. I somehow missed that completely. I mean, it's blink and you'll miss it, but it is there. Yeah. Um, Veltorchka is rated beautiful. Sela is rated very good, and Emma is rated nice. But at the same time, various things about the portrayal in the show make Degwin ridiculous. Like, we're meant to laugh at him. It's presenting him as a figure to be laughed at, but also using him as an opportunity to give the audience a shot up Sela's tennis skirt. And Amaro flips up Haman's skirt and a mobile suit dives under it. <laughs> True. There are, and all the stuff with the bathhouse, why a girl's high school has its own bathhouse, I have no idea. Uh, some idea. <laughs> That's a rhetorical no idea. Uh, at least those scenes were funny. That's a big part of the humor in this series, it seems mm -hmm. like. And I mean, Amuro is like running around peeing on Char, like... There's a lot of different forms of harassment going on in this in this episode. Gosh, that reminded me of um, there was a book that we had to read portions of for a Japanese history class. I think it was called Musui's Story mm -hmm. that was about it's like a firsthand account, a samurai, not particularly high ranking, but uh, his diaries about his childhood. And one of the stories he tells some other kids hazing him, tie him up and then lift him up toward the ceiling of a building. They put the rope over a rafter and they hoist him into the air and they leave him there for a while. And they're going to take all his food. So he just pees on them. He pees on them and the food uh, <laughs> from where they've hoisted him up. And this made me think of that. <laughs> yeah. I did think it was funny that these elite high schools basically look like resorts. Tennis courts, swimming pool, bathhouse, <laughs> video phones. And curtains for the video phones, because for some reason there's a video phone in the bathhouse. <laughs> I can't possibly imagine why. I mean, the, the setup of like hoity-toity elite high school versus delinquents is a, a classic from this era. There are an enormous number of sort of pulpy, fun, delinquent films from this era. Uh, I've not seen even a fraction of them. And so I'm sure that this whole short is just like, 
run through with references to specific films and TV shows that I could never hope to identify all of them. I do know when we first go to see the delinquent high school and one of the first shots we get is of four playing with a yo-yo. The yo-yo is like absolutely a reference to Sukeban Deka, which was a manga series, a three season TV show and two movies all before this short came out. So it's a pretty popular and recognizable reference. Sukeban is a name for a girl delinquent, right? right? And the iconic Sukeban outfit involves the super long skirt, which both for and Haman in that photo of her as a delinquent uh, have the Sukeban skirt on. And the delinquent mobile suit, the pink one. Mm, that's right. Uh, Streets of Fire, Amaro in his vest with no shirt under it and chain necklace, though that could also be out of The Warriors. Yeah. Uh, a lot of the scenes where everything is a sort of desert and kicking up dust and all these vehicles, none of which look related to each other in any way. They all look modified and souped up. Uh, it's very Mad Maxi. I love the double Zeta, which is just the double Zeta pulling a cart, but on the back of the cart, uh, somebody has written V6. They do some little profiles for all the Gundam protagonists when they appear at the attack on the elite schools. And one of the points that they include is what vehicle they drive. But what they actually have written is Aisha, I like love, and Sha like car. Uh, which one of our dictionaries described as someone's wheels, their beloved vehicle. Mm. Like, this isn't just what they drive. It's their their beloved <laughs> vehicle, whatever it might be. Mm -hmm. For some reason, Judo is blonde. Well, the blonde hair is like a classic punk delinquent mm, signifier. That's fair. I love that they gave Lena a machine gun. Lena deserves a machine gun. Really the way these background characters are portrayed feels so not true to them but like right Soroko and Jared playing golf all hoity-toity at an indoor driving range I don't know if you noticed this but Mashima is playing tennis against the O and he has a rose clutched in his teeth as he plays Punk Haro is the uh, best Haro so far Punk Haro is the definitive Haro <laughs> I love Ultimate Haro? When Punk Haro is harassing the golf players, he does it by knocking over the like massive baskets full of balls, freeing the orbs. Punk Haro is staging an uprising. Because you know, orbs, they're the perfect shape for revolution. Uh... <laughs> I cannot imagine how anybody would render this in English, but I'm pretty sure when the girls show up with tea for Sirocco and Jared at the driving range, and Sirocco has a line about the golf balls, and he, he pulls out a single golden one and says they should all be gold, that's a testicles joke. <laughs> because uh, he says, Tama wa kin ni kagiru. Kin tama, or gold ball, is a word for testicles in Japanese. So he's he's making a balls joke. Ho, 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 ho. Oh, ho, ho. Balls. So risque. And even if that's not more true to his character than the destitute version from the Rolling Colony affair, it's way funnier. Like, it plays on our understanding of him as this, like, creepy but very effete and highfalutin kind of guy. They show up very briefly, but Kiara and Yazan are also there. Uh, Yazan's just a drunk, and they reprise his westerny cloak, uh, which is very appropriate to that setting. But Kiara chases a dog and then is chased back, and when she's chased back, she's running on all fours, <laughs> and it's very cat-eyed Kiara again. She has the meat clutched in her mouth by that point, right? Uh, that I'm not certain of, probably. <laughs> It's extremely silly, but another background gag that I quite enjoyed was while the Alex Band is performing, there are still people setting up the stage. And the first time we watched this, I was too distracted by the English of the song uh, <laughs> to notice anything else. I, my, me, your steady girl. Okay. Um, 
You know that's a full song? You can find it on Spotify. Wow. Okay. Uh, <laughs> but in the background, there's a mobile suit hammering nails with its head. It's just like headbutting a <laughs> nail into the side of this stage. And then Bright is also hammering nails, but manages to miss and hit himself in the back of the head. Which is why he's being hauled off on an ambulance by Garma later. Yeah, the one hammering with its head is the uh, is an SD version of the Jim Sniper 2 with its like drop down night vision visor that it has. Its head kind of looks like a hammer, so I assume that's what it's. Um, you mentioned the song. There's a couple of songs in this performed by the Alex Band, and those are being sung by the actual voice actors. That's Kawamura Maria, who was Beltorchka and Quest, um, and then also singing on that is Honda Chieko, who was Puru. And there's the very distinct contrast between that more poppy song and then the kind of like punk, not even really sung exactly song that the Party Crashers perform. The one that's just kind of being shouted by yeah. Judo. Actually Judo's voice actor. Uh, that's fantastic. That that's really fun. Uh, a group of guys who I think consist of McVeigh, Jamaican, and one other guy are streaking. Did you notice that? And being chased by the um, psycho, gu- the pink psycho Gundam. I don't think they're streaking um, intentionally. I oh. think their clothes have been stolen. Oh, dear. <laughs> I also, the creators of SD Gundam clearly love the Zacrello. Because it's shown up way more often than it has any right to. And I'm here for it. It's hilarious. It's just a funny looking mobile suit. Uh, And it found love. It found love at the Boys and Girls Social Club. They call it the Takeyari Depa Zakrelo. And Depa is buck-toothed. But Takeyari is a bamboo spear. And I couldn't find... Like, what it meant to combine those two terms, if anything. The bamboo spear thing, that word, takeyari, also appears in a saying that has to do with being kind of uh, disadvantaged technologically in a fight, but still fighting really hard. Mm. So it could mean sort of like barbarian (laughs) or like... Oh, yeah, okay. Fierce fighting buck-toothed Zacrello. Yeah, I buy it. In a larger sense, from a sort of bird's eye view of this episode, they've done something very clever, which is they've essentially inverted the hero's journey, the character evolution that takes place in each of the three original Gundam shows. Because each of those is really about the teenager who is growing up and learning painfully how to fit into the role into which he has fallen whether that's Amaro learning how to be a soldier, Camille learning how to be a soldier, or Judo and all of his friends growing up and making good. You know, we talked at the end of season three about how it really feels like the ending of Double Zeta is about all of these kids from the slums, you know, becoming well-adjusted, normal members of productive middle-class society. Here they do the opposite. Here, it's about reverting to that delinquent state, to that delinquent energy, and about bringing Shar and Haman back into the fold and going off together to wreck more stuff. The ending where Shar says, what's with this beautiful sunset, and insists on graffitiing over it, was really good. I mean, the whole, like, when he hops onto the, the stagehand Mark IIs that have been following him around, turning them into a kind of tricycle, and tears off his fancy fringed clothing to reveal he's been wearing the quattro outfit underneath it all along. Ah, chef's kiss. I wish there was more to this than just this one short because it would be a lot of fun to research like delinquent fashion and other issues like that from the 80s and just spend a few weeks working on these questions. Unfortunately, we don't have the time to do that, but ah, it's so... This one just has so many good ideas in it. It's stuffed full of interesting things. We'll be able to touch on some of it, I'm sure. Haman's hair is crimped or curly, which I think was fashionable at that time, and may also be hinting at the delinquent thing. Shar's outfit has a bunch of fringe, I think, hanging off of the arms, like really <laughs> yes. long fringe. Was that was that popular? I was don't... that the cool 
suede address. I mean, I get in 1989. I get almost Evil Knievel or like Elvis vibes from his outfit. I do not have any idea why Amaro's vest has the symbol for an onsen on the back. It's that symbol is used on maps to mark hot spring locations. And it's also part of the the bank of emoji that we use now. Why it would be on his vest, I really don't know. Similarly, Judo's jacket or vest has the woman symbol on the back of it. No clue why. And this is an actual no clue, not a rhetorical <laughs> no clue. Uh, this is the first SD Gundam short to incorporate the characters from 0080. Besides the Alex band, which gives us um, the Alex itself, a mass production gun cannon, and Kempfer and Hygog all playing instruments. We get Chris and Bernie running the uh, dating club event, presumably because they're the only ones to have like even kind of a relationship. Seeing Chris on the rollerblades with the baseball bat, of course, brings to mind Paranoia Agent. But because Paranoia Agent happened after this, it makes me wonder if that was like a thing delinquents on rollerblades with baseball bats causing trouble and wrecking stuff. Feels uh, right. It does, doesn't it? Uh, and there's something very funny about her getting increasingly like agitated and angry while Bernie is just trying to calm her down. Make your mouth! Don't you want a girlfriend? Talk to her! Um, <laughs> and then later when Bernie is doing the play-by-play... As yeah. if it were a live sporting event. And Camille, hold it. Hi, I'm Camille. <laughs> yeah. Everyone's reaction when he cat Camille's there is just uh, very charming. We are at the point now where some of the running gags are starting to pick up speed. Some things that were not funny initially are starting to become funny through sheer repetition and... Bopping! Exactly. But also the gun tank wandering through a scene to offer people refreshments. Although in this instance, much fancier refreshments. Well, it's a fancy school. Ghost Lala is fantastic. I love her so much. <laughs> with I the beam the... saber through her head. I love that she just shows up with like snapshots of her and Quattro. Well, and the, the uh, that they make a joke out of the thing we pointed out at the time where nobody recognizes that Quattro is just Char or Char Quattro. Because when Lala first shows Haman the photos, she's like, they don't look anything alike. Only for Lala to put the sunglasses on him and ruffle his hair so it's messy instead of slicked back. And suddenly everyone is like, <gasps> It's the same guy. Student Council President Char, he is a quattro. And yet it would appear that Lala didn't necessarily want to break them up because after Char goes full delinquent mode uh, and Haman is still on the fence about it, it's Lala who shows her the picture of her delinquent past and convinces her to go uh, join in. Lala just wants everybody to be true to themselves. And now, Nina's research on delinquents of the bubble era. In the talkback, we mentioned a few non-Japanese films that we think could have influenced the design of this episode. Films like Streets of Fire, The Warriors, Mad Max, and we touched on some of the visual elements that were recognizable references to Japan's youth gang culture. But what exactly are Yankee, Bosozoku, and Sukeban? How did those visual elements become so stereotypical that they're a useful shorthand, even decades later? And were youth gangs especially prominent in the late 80s? First off, what is a subculture? Different sociologists have defined the term in different ways, but the points most illuminating for this discussion are 1. Subcultures define themselves in opposition to the dominant culture. 2. Subcultures fulfill the desire for deviance and the desire for belonging. And 3. Subcultures have their own values, modes of communication and language, 
standards of behavior, social conventions, rituals, modes of dress, and so on, that identify group members to each other and reinforce both deviance from the norm and belonging to the group. When you define it that way, it actually makes Al joining the Cyclops team in 0080 feel a lot like a metaphor for joining a subculture. They have a different set of rules. They are set aside from the rest of society. It gives him a sort of deviance. And explains why he has to wear the patch all the time, even though, in theory, someone could recognize it and recognize that it's a Xeon patch. Like many troubled youths, Al joined a gang. I mean, the military is a subculture, <laughs> but that's a different conversation. All of this is to say, I'm going to be talking about fashion a lot, but it's important to remember that the aesthetics are largely inseparable from the subculture itself. A person probably wouldn't adopt the aesthetics of one of these subcultures if they didn't want to belong to it, even if they're only doing it some of the time or even if it's kind of an identity exploration thing, it's still part of who they are or who they're sort of figuring themselves out to be. In the book Fashioning Japanese Subcultures, Kawamura Yuniya quoted Richard Cloward and Lloyd Olin, explaining that, quote, delinquent gangs are caught between opportunity structures of the working and middle classes, and that navigating this in-betweenish space gives rise to a lot of subcultures. The three terms I mentioned earlier were yanki, bosozoku, and sukeban. There's a fair amount of overlap between these groups, and they share commonalities, but there are also some distinctions between them. Yankee, as a style and a subculture, really solidified in the 1970s, when improving economic conditions meant that blue-collar workers emerged as a significant group of consumers. In his book Ametora, How Japan Saved American Style, W. David Marks writes, until the late 1970s, the vast majority of fashionable Japanese teens came from privileged backgrounds. Brands and magazines assumed their audience would enjoy white-collar careers with ever-climbing salaries and growing piles of disposable income. Heibon Punch prepped office drones for climbing up the corporate ladder, while Popeye lectured its city boys on which imported goods most impressed girls in collegiate tennis clubs. It is perhaps more significant than it initially appears that the uh, fancy high schools in this short have tennis clubs. In the same way that in the mockumentary Otaku no Video, when the normal well-adjusted kid drops out of regular society to become a professional otaku, he does so in part by quitting his tennis club. Like in the US, I believe there are certain hoity-toity connotations to tennis in Japan. There was also a big vogue for tennis at one point because a crown prince and future emperor played a lot of tennis. And so certain young women may have thought, oh, well, if I you know, join these tennis clubs, maybe I'll get to meet the prince. It's the now retired Empress Emerita Michiko, uh, who met the then crown prince Akihito on a tennis court in Nagano in 1957. And, of course, they make a point of showing us a tennis court and girls in tennis whites in this SD short. But rather than aspirational emulation of the styles of college students and white-collar workers, who were frankly thought of as effeminate and affected, blue-collar young people wanted new styles that were showy and, as one source put it, deliberately vulgar. Now, the style has changed a lot over time. The roots go back to the occupation and the significant influence of U.S. culture. Think rockabilly, rebel without a cause, Elvis, American soul music, the films American Graffiti and Grease. But there was also the showy style of the Yakuza, or Japanese gangsters, combined with a kind of anti-austerity pursuit of excess that reminded me of the Zoot Suit. You can easily look up pictures of the zoot suit. Zoot suits were very popular in the 30s and into the 40s in the United States. Uh, they tended to involve a lot of fabric, big jackets, baggy pants, broad shoulders. And then they came to be seen as un-American during World War II because there was cloth rationing. However, if you were a young man in a minority community, 
you maybe don't care about being un-American given racism in America. And so you wear it anyway as kind of a, a way to stick it to the U.S. government. But then people who know about the rationing maybe attack you in the street. Like, it's it was a whole thing. The Zoot Suit Riot was an attack on Mexican-American people in Southern California. Not really about Zoot Suits. Kind of, maybe a little, not really, but... About things that the Zoot Suit... Represented. Yeah. And in the immediate post-war period in Japan... You've got all these people basically living in rags because there is no production of regular consumer goods and there hasn't been for some time. There's been shortages for a really long time and people don't have new clothes. But you have these young guys who either through a criminal connection or a kind of gray market connection hook American servicemen up with things they want in exchange for these like flashy bolts of fabric and suits and stuff. After that, the flashy outfit of choice was an untucked Hawaiian shirt and General MacArthur-esque sunglasses. Then there was a fad for mambo and mambo pants. Then we get to the jeans and leather jackets stage. But the point was always to be flashy and exaggerated and to one-up other members of your group. The iconic hairstyle is a high pompadour in front with the sides slicked back which used to be called a regent, but is now just called the Yankee. And if you see it on a character in anime or manga, you know right away that they're a delinquent. Same with certain types of sunglasses and with high-waisted, voluminous, but tapered at the ankle pants. I feel like you never see those pants on anybody who's not a delinquent, unless maybe they're a martial artist, maybe. Another Yankee-associated garment is the Sukajan, a satin, letterman-style jacket, elaborately embroidered, usually with some stereotypically East Asian motif like dragons or tigers or phoenixes. Initially, these were made and marketed for Americans as a souvenir to take back to the United States, which made it perfect for Yankees in pursuit of American kitsch. Arguably one of the most influential people in establishing the style was Yamazaki Masayuki, a 1950s style obsessed bar and club owner who later opened the famous store Cream Soda, selling imported vintage clothes from the US and UK, as well as making and selling lookalike and retro designs. Although he later tried to distance the style from delinquents, there was no denying that the style was a reaction against preppy Ivy League style and inspired by rock and rollers, troublemakers, and misfits. It's hard to wrap our heads around it now, since jeans are basically ubiquitous, but there was a time when jeans were not considered appropriate attire in most settings. In Ametora, one young person is quoted as describing the delinquent-like behavior of young U.S. soldiers, such as wearing jeans, whistling, and cursing. As the Yankee style spread, many clubs and bars banned anyone wearing sunglasses or with their hair in that regent hairstyle. By the 1980s, most young delinquents sporting the style wouldn't have known that Yankee was a reference to Americans. They were far enough removed that they were emulating their older brothers, their school senpai, Japanese rock bands, rather than GIs in grungy Yokosuka bars. The term itself became a kind of catch-all for bad boy teens, and Yankee as a retro style movement peaked in the early 80s, and was nearly extinct by the end of the decade, though obviously certain aspects have stuck around and evolved rather than disappearing completely. Bosozoku refers to biker gangs. The boso part means something like running wild, while zoku means tribe. These groups would modify their motorcycles and scooters, changing everything from the paint job and seats to handlebars, shell, and mufflers. I will try to include some side-by-side -side reference pictures so you can compare the counterattack school's vehicles to some photos of Bosozoku. Groups would ride together down major thoroughfares in Tokyo, causing as big a ruckus as possible. Sometimes more of a nuisance, but many times outright dangerous. Speeding, weaving in and out of traffic, terrorizing people with wooden swords, metal pipes, baseball bats, and busting up cars that got in their way. Aesthetically, they borrowed a lot of the Yankees' tough guy clothing and showy hairstyles, 
But as the fashion industry made Yankee-style mainstream and, quote, sucked all the toughness out of leather jackets, Hawaiian shirts, and jeans, Bosozoku style changed. It's a style based largely on shock value. So in addition to the punch perms, regent hairdos, and tall biker boots, they started to incorporate clothing and imagery that emulated far-right groups. Rising sun flags and headbands, clothes embroidered with nationalist slogans, swastikas. Interviews from that time show that most Bosozoku members didn't hold far-right, fascist, or nationalist views, but adopted these styles and symbols because it made them scarier to polite society. Just like their motorcycles, their clothing was highly modified. School uniforms would get a flashy lining that showed when the sleeves were rolled up, or higher collars or more voluminous pants. Jumpsuits or military jackets would be covered in embroidered kanji of gang names, slogans, gang symbols, flags, and so on. These outfits are called tokofuku, meaning something like special attack uniform. One hilarious anecdote that illustrates the prominence of tsupari, or delinquent teen, aesthetics at this time and simultaneously their mainstreaming, is that of the Nameneko album, a book of photographs of kittens dressed up as delinquent high schoolers. Ametora has a few of the photos printed in it, and they are ridiculous and cute. The album sold about half a million copies. Even more popular was the Nameneko fake driver's license, which apparently a lot of real Bosozoku liked to use when pulled over by the police. That one sold 15 million units. Over the years, Tokyo closed major streets to traffic on Sundays, ostensibly to make the area a pedestrian paradise, but also to put an end to runs by Bosozoku. Police began to enforce harsher and harsher penalties for reckless driving and were quicker to take away someone's license. Like Yankee style generally, Bosozoku prominence and membership numbers peaked in the early 80s and has been in decline ever since. The last term I mentioned was sukeban, a contraction of the word suke, used by gangsters to refer to their female companions, and bancho, a term for a gang leader. It refers to an individual or to a girl gang. While there are yankee girls and girls in bosozoku, early girl gangs formed because mainstream gangs wouldn't accept women as members. Echoing the Yankee subculture's origins as an identity for counterculture, working class, and poor young people, one source, quoting a woman who lived in Japan during the girl gang's heyday, said, quote, They are all from working class neighborhoods. It seemed that their rebellion was linked to the fact that they knew they would never become princess office ladies or adorable marriage fodder for white collar salarymen. From 1965 to 1981, the portion of juvenile delinquents who were girls nearly doubled, from less than 10% to 19%. Sukaban style, like Yankee and Bosozoku, featured modified school uniforms, a cropped shirt that revealed the midriff, long skirts, simultaneously a rejection of mainstream feminine cuteness and sexualization, and a good hiding place for weapons, and jackets adorned with buttons, badges, and dense embroidery. They wore Converse or other rubber-soled sneakers instead of school uniform loafers, and they frequently dyed or permed their hair, a la Haman's wavy hair in this short. They wore little to no makeup or heavy makeup, the opposite of whatever was considered fashionable for normal girls at the time. Despite the stereotype of sukeban as masculine, which is to say loud, aggressive, violent, and rude, they were the subject of a wave of sexploitation films throughout the 50s, 60s, and 70s. Termed pinku ega, or pink films, these were cheaply made and featured the kind of violence, sex, and nudity that wasn't shown on television. Films with names like Girls Junior High School, Bad Habit, A Virgin's Sex Manual, and Co-Ed Report, Yuko's White Breasts. These were, in most respects, Yakuza movies but with schoolgirls instead of gangsters. Tom mentioned the long-running Sukebandeka by Wada Shinji in the talkback. It's the story of a delinquent girl who is released from prison but forced to work for the police. They threaten to kill her mother if she refuses. The manga series ran from 1973 to 1983, as I mentioned before, the height of a lot of youth gang activity in Japan, and was just one of many series with Sukeban characters. 
And while the fashions for girl gangs have changed and evolved over time, the old image of the sukeban has had as much staying power as that of Yankee and Bosozoku. Think of Kino Makoto, better known as Sailor Jupiter from the series Sailor Moon. Her height, independence, physical strength, and long skirt all hint at a tough girl side. And early in the series, there's a rumor she was kicked out of her old school for fighting. Kill Bill's Gogo Yubari owes much of her depiction, the violence, of course, but also the deep husky voice and general speech pattern, to the Sukeban type. I feel as though I should make an aside here that different people's impressions of all of these groups are going to vary, and there's obviously a big range in what delinquency means. Everything from being obnoxious and noisy and running away from home and cutting school to mugging people, beating people up. Like, it's a huge range. And obviously, there are going to be people out there who've had really bad experiences with youth gangs. And so the sort of more innocuous depiction in media is not going to sit well with such people. In the same way that there's a huge range of depictions of Yakuza, from violent, dangerous criminals to, like honorable criminals and <laughs> somewhat heroic so occasionally adorable yeah I have, I have played at least one yakuza game and i've seen people talk about how the yakuza game actually really bothers them <laughs> because of their own personal exposure to yakuza in japan so obviously it's a complicated issue the way it's portrayed in media but it is a, a long-standing portrayal and not all of these groups, not every Yankee, not every Sukeban is going to go on to be a lifelong criminal. There is a sense that once they turn 20 and are considered legal adults, some of them become Yakuza and some of them take up some kind of other work and engage in less delinquent-like behavior. I'd been aware of a lot of these visual archetypes for some time, almost entirely from watching anime. <laughs> Uh, but I really enjoyed learning about their history and development. I know Tom cannot confirm or deny anything because spoilers, but is it too much to hope for a Bosozoku inspired Gundam series? Disaffected teens with modified mechs and bad attitudes? I'm sorry, was Double Zeta not enough for you? The attitudes could have been worse. The machines could have been more modified. Yeah, I'll concede it. We need a Triple Zeta. It could have been bloodier. More violent. More people could have died. I'm cutting you off. You've had enough Gundam. I read a very entertaining review for Sukeban Deka, and one of the things it mentions is just how violent that series is. And that basically every main character is killed off by the end, although this particular reviewer thinks that that was the author being thoroughly sick of the story and the characters and wanting to avoid any possibility of being asked to write a sequel. Next time on episode 6.4, The Hour of the Hippo, we research and discuss SD Gundam's counterattack part 2 and Gundam Army vs. the Army of Darkness. Red states and blue states. I'm rude now. They gave a castle V fins and the Gundam a mustache. Show Gundam, I don't even know him! Gundam Sentai Show, Centaur Zeta, Spanish Guitar Music. If a horse wore a Gundam, would it wear it like this or like this? Ruse de Guerre and Carping. This served no purpose, but nevertheless, Mobile Suit Breakdown is written, recorded, and produced by us, Nina and Tom, in scenic New York City, within the ancestral and unceded land of the Lenape people, and made possible by listeners like you. The opening track is Wasp by Misha Dioxin. The closing music is Long Way Home by Spinning Ratio. The recap music is Olivia by Hyson. 
You can find links to the sources for our research, the music used in the episode, additional information about the Lenape people, and more in the show notes and on our website, GundamPodcast.com. You can get in touch with us on Twitter or Instagram at Gundam Podcast, or by email to GundamPodcast at gmail.com. And thank you for listening. I don't know, Nina. Is it ever going to be safe to share wrong Gundam opinions with the world again? Wrong Gundam opinions like... 0080's preoccupation with hands has nothing to do with being artful or some philosophical point about the neutral nature of a tool. No, 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 no. You have to ask yourself, what goes into a pocket? Your hands? If people don't share wrong Gundam opinions like that, then those wrong opinions are just going to keep building up inside them until something terrible happens. This week's Wrong Gundam Opinion came from an anonymous patron in the MSB Discord. Thank you, mysterious patron. And this is kind of what humans do. <laughs> Alter their environment to suit them. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. We like overgrown, relatively hairless beavers. And in prior SDs, there was a lot of that with, like, Shar and Sela. But what's funny to me is that while this this sort of like sister complex thing gets brought up a lot in like fan art and fan interpretations of some of these relationships, on viewing the actual like source text material, there's none of that in First Gundam or in Double Zeta. There's no there's no implication at all that there's anything weird about Judo's relationship with Lena or with any of his surrogate sisters. The Pudus, etc. Judo just like except for that sort of last minute hookup with Rue at the end of the show, doesn't seem interested in girls at all in Double Zeta. Uh, yeah. I guess the only other thing I was gonna mention was, uh, Butterfly Camille. (laughs) Camille hatches from a star cocoon to become a moth or butterfly. And flies away with the Pudus on his back. Yep. I like that they've just decided that Camille is just going to be absurd. It's going to be weird. He wears a gnome hat. Sometimes he's a cat. Sometimes he's a moth. He gets carried around in almost like a papoose (laughs) by one of the mobile suits. He wants to date all the girls. Or he just wants to block everyone. That's not helping. It's helping me. Yeah, no need to remember anything that's not deeply related to Gundam. Who are you again? (laughs) I'm a longtime Gundam fan. (laughs) rudeness arc. I'm rude now. <laughs> I'd been aware of a lot of these visual arc of a lot of these visual arc <laughs> I'd been aware of a lot of these visual <laughs> Is that it? Yep. All done? That's everything. Excellent. Was it good? Yeah, I thought it was great. It was just under 2,000 words.